Hi everyone, I'm Tom Sadler. I'm a principal software engineer working on BBC iPlayer and Sounds, which are the BBC's uh, video and audio streaming services respectively. Uh, and I'm currently the secretary and one of the directors on the InnerSource Commons board. So, um, so I work primarily with the teams that build iPlayer and Sounds for connected TV devices, uh, so smart TV set-up boxes, games consoles, things like that. Um, and the way that uh, those applications are architected is around uh, micro front ends, uh, mostly product specific, uh, but we have the shared sign in and user management experience um, and many shared libraries. Um, and we've split the responsibilities for, for building each of these different areas of the products across uh, six teams. Um, some teams will focus on uh, shared code, such as the build and launch team and also the core playback team. Some will focus mostly on an area of the user experience, such as the iPlayer playback experience team, uh, and others will have a mixture. Um, so the sign-in team own uh, platform capabilities uh, around application lifecycle, uh, and the sounds user experience team uh, also own the analytics and experimentation platform capabilities. Uh, finally, the iPlayer browse team also own the shared navigation capabilities. Um, so all the teams work in an inner source way. Um, often product features will require crossing those boundaries. Um, and we found that this, this balance of ownership and autonomy within a source um, has been working quite well. Um, but a lot of the times, uh, you know, working this closely across the teams, um, there are decisions that get made that impact the other teams. So we've been doing uh, we're doing a lot of work recently on understanding that decision making process uh, and some of the factors that go into it. So I'm going to take you through uh, a few different factors that we've identified, um, starting with uh, team structure and ownership. So um, I guess for a bit of background, it's worth to think about the the different. Um, yeah, different team structures and, and ownership models that might exist. So um, this is a kind of fairly straightforward example. You've got an agile cross-discipline team um, and they own, they own an application in its entirety and all the components that make it up. Um, it's, things can be fairly easy in this model because you don't have to worry so much about other teams, but obviously um, there's no inner source going on here. There's not so much collaboration. Um, but because this model is quite easy, I think that's maybe why some people will resist inner source because of the, um, I guess the, the overhead in getting started, uh, even though I think I imagine the people on this call agree that the, uh, that the value is, is worth that investment in the end. So taking a bit more of a complex example, start to bring in some of the inner source um, principles. Um, is where you have um, an application that's mostly owned by one team, um, but with some libraries or some components being built by another team. Um, I mean, this could also be the platform model. It could be that um, it could be that those those green libraries that I've got in my fake architecture diagram uh, are just platform libraries that are pulled in uh, without much thought. But ideally, this relationship would be a two-way inner source relationship where um, the, uh, you know, the, the green team can help the orange team adopt, and also the orange team can contribute back to the green team. Uh, and if we look at, again, a more complex architecture where there's upstream and downstream dependencies, uh, again, those, those API boundaries, those dependencies uh, are also great opportunities uh, for inner source. This is kind of what we've got in uh, in iPlayer and Sounds on TV, where we have applications owned by uh, a multitude of teams. Um, so no one team owns it, and this can, as I'll get onto later, this is where decision making can become quite important. Um, and also, there's not just one application. There might be again upstream downstream services, uh, and the boundaries between them that that you need to bear in mind. Um, and again, more and more complex org structures um, where you're you're perhaps working across business units. Maybe there is like a, a platform team that's delivering uh, a library that, that that's being used by another business unit or multiple business units. Um, and again, 
that can be that can be more difficult um you know as the org structure gets more distanced um you know collaborating and uh and getting aligned on decisions can be more difficult um, but also potentially more valuable um and just want to briefly talk about the racy acronym if people aren't aware of it um because this will this will help you think about um of of the teams impacted by a decision um you know how much engagement is necessary so uh, teams or individuals who are responsible um are the people that kind of actually do the work um, the accountable people tend to be the kind of uh, managers or uh, managers or principals or product owners that essentially um yeah, they're accountable to the business. It's, it's them who get fired if it doesn't happen. Um, consulted is where um, someone might not be, someone might not be um, directly working on the problem, but they have expertise that you need to uh, that you need to extract from them. Uh, and informed is where um, a decision impacts someone, but they might. That they may be involved after the fact. You don't necessarily need their input into the decision. Uh, so bearing in mind that the ownership models and the, the team structure and racy, um, when you have a decision to make, um, if you think about those things, you can figure out who should be involved. Um, and you also need to think about what software components are being impacted. So uh, the next kind of group of factors I want to talk about is type and complexity. Um, and this can mean various things, but what I'm kind of talking about here, I guess it is more, maybe more complexity than type, but um, you know, asking things like, if there's an obvious solution to the problem you're trying to solve, then maybe that's not the kind of decision where you need to get absolutely everyone involved. Maybe you can go more on the informed side of things. Um, however, if you've got a new precedent or going against technical principles, then you need to consult with you know, people who um, who have fed into the technical principles in the past and will want to say in how it's changing. Uh, security concerns, yeah, maybe that's when you need to get your information security team um, or your technical architects involved, again, consulted. Um, and there are other things that can affect how complex a decision is. Uh, and what level of engagement is necessary. Uh, basically, the lower the complexity, the less engagement you need most of the time. None of this is set in stone, but that's a bit of a bit of a guideline, bit of a rule of thumb that you can take. Um, and uh, the final kind of group of factors, so I'm grouping some factors together. Uh, the final group of factors I want to talk about is quality alignment and speed, um, but specifically short-term speed. Because I think we've got we've got this idea that when we're delivering software, we talk about speed. We're, we're talking about short term speed because investing in quality and alignment um, will actually increase your long term speed. You know, reduces technical debt and things like that. Increases code reuse. Um, so yeah, speed in that context is really short term speed rather than speed overall. Um, so yeah, these are these are these can often be trade offs amongst uh, each other. They don't always have to be trade offs. Um, in an ideal world, they wouldn't be trade offs. But yeah, I think most of the time, uh, kind of balancing these three things. Uh, obviously, quality again that could that could be a whole a whole research topic. Uh, what do we mean by quality? Um, you know, maintainability. How easy it is to con contribute to, or how, how easy it is to adopt. Um, but um, broadly, yeah, <laughs> trying to ignore the fact that quality is uh, a difficult subject. Um, broadly, it's, it's one of the factors we need to think about. So um, I guess in, in a very inner source world, you're probably not necessarily optimizing for short term speed. Inner source more align, uh, more prioritizes alignment and quality. Um, whereas if you want to optimize for short-term speed and alignment, um, you might not think too much about the decision. You might just go with existing patterns or kind of whatever's off the shelf, whatever's going to kind of get your way trying to go as quickly as possible in the short term. 
um, without researching different methods or new frameworks or, or anything like that. Uh, and then something like strong ownership. Um, strong ownership will generally get good speed and good quality, but too strong ownership means that you're missing out on alignment because you're you're only really um, getting input from your from your local group. And then another dimension, which is um, yeah, you can either think of this as um, a kind of parallel or another one to throw into the mix is investment in people. It's you know, something that we uh, we really value um, in our teams. Um, but what will often happen is if you if you give people opportunities to stretch themselves, give uh, give people some some ownership and autonomy, um, especially you know people perhaps newer to the domain or or less experienced in general, um, you're trading off the certainty of um, those other factors that I was talking about. So yeah, you get this kind of thing where um, you know you might want to you might want to do something really quickly of high quality, and you kind of throw together all your senior engineers and get them to do it. Or maybe if something isn't quite as time critical, you can in, invest in people um, and get it aligned um, and get lots of people involved, lots of voices involved. So with these various factors in mind, uh, you can think about what decision making tools you want to use. Um, and I've just kind of put together um, the first few that came to mind uh, that we use in, in the teams that I work with. Um, so, you know, if something is if something's like low complexity and doesn't really impact too many teams, um, then you might want to do something quite unilaterally. Um, however, if you want something with really high alignment because it's quite complex or if it's uh, impacting a lot of teams, so like you know, if you're changing the API on a library that's used by like 10 different teams, um, then you might want to use an RFC. Um, so that's a request for comments document. Um, uh, the Inner Source Commons has got some uh, materials on RFCs if people are interested in doing some reading on that uh, later on. Um, it's, one of the one of the inner source patterns uh transparent cross-team decision making with rfcs i think it's called if you're interested in in that or, or aren't aware of rfcs um again that's learning from the open source you, you might have heard of rfcs in, in the open source rather than uh used internally uh something like a working group um you're definitely not optimizing for speed if you're uh, doing synchronous meetings and bringing people together, but that's going to result in a lot of alignment and a lot of quality. Uh, a team workshop is kind of not a huge amount of alignment because you're just having a single team involved, um, but you should get good quality if you've got the whole team involved in something. Um, and then something like a prototype um, is, uh, is another way of uh, driving that decision making, you know, Here's here's a decision. Here's the prototype of that decision. Is that okay, or do we need to iterate on the decision? Um, and what we've been doing, um, we've been running some sessions with the teams to look at some of the decisions we've made uh, retrospectively, um, and we've found that this has really helped the teams understand the factors that I've talked about um, and learn from. The decisions that they've made. Um, so the way we've been running it is we've been using this kind of like fake architecture diagram, uh, similar to the illustrations I was using earlier when I was talking about team structure and ownership. Um, so we kind of printed this out on a uh, on an A3 paper, got people to scribble on it, um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go into that now. But I've included this slide so you can uh, do a printout if you fancy running this uh, exercise yourself. Um, I, I don't know where we normally share slides, actually, but I'll uh, I'll share them in uh, the Inner Source Commons Slack at least. So uh, on these fake architecture diagrams, we had teams um, annotate the the fake diagram with components that have been changed or are about to be changed as part of the decision. Um, so this is kind of a simple example where there is a shared library across two applications and the API is changing. So the, the kind of the scope, the, the teams affected or the ownership areas affected um, are 
both the, the red team who kind of have could do autonomy, but they need to bear in mind their consuming team um, who own the yellow application, yellow, orange, yellow, um, uh, because the API is changing and they're going to have to take that. Um, and uh, we were also uh, using counters to signify the complexity. So in this example, the actual, the number of teams or ownership areas affected is very small, um, but it's a change in a small area that's very complex. Um, and um, just an example, it, it's affected a third party. Uh, and then the next part of the exercise was to think about the people involved. So yeah, with, with the first kind of lower complexity, but larger scope example, um, the people involved would be developers from both the red team and the yellow team. Uh, whereas the, the kind of lower scope, but higher complexity example, you want to get the whole team involved uh, and cross disciplines as well. Um, so yeah, when you, uh, when you're changing a third party interface, you're going to want to get your uh, your business management people and your technical architects, things like that. Um, so I'll go through some of the actual examples that came out of the workshops uh, and some of the some of the insights that we gained from this. Um, so this example uh, shows the the state management for the TV applications. Um, so yeah, this one was uh, quite a broad scope within the TV applications, um, a high amount of complexity in the, the actual application lifecycle area that was initializing uh, the state management, and then some complexity, but lower complexity in the areas that just consumed uh, read, read the current state. Um, and um, the way we went about this at the time um, was with an RFC. Um, so that was able to uh, make sure that the way state management was being done was acceptable to all of the TV client teams, all the iPlayer and Sounds on TV teams that this impacted. Um, and the interesting one, when we, when we did a retrospective on this decision is if there was an earlier iteration where we didn't do an RFC and we decided on a different solution for state management. And actually the teams, when we started working on it, the teams came back and said, actually, that's not really acceptable. We need to revisit this decision. So with the benefit of hindsight, we could have saved ourselves a couple of sprints worth of work um, by investing more in the decision-making process in the first place. Like we try to optimize for short-term speed and we got the exact opposite because we weren't aligned enough. Um, another example, so this is where uh, the media services team um, upgrading the encoding software. Um, it makes sense for the, you know, the experts in the field to decide when that upgrade is necessary. Um, but then the actual kind of blast radius of that decision was quite large because all of the, all of the iPlayer um, actually, it wasn't just iPlayer, kind of sport and news and, and everything within the BBC. All of those different platforms that do media playback uh, were impacted by that change. They had to, uh, you know, update their tests, do some manual testing uh, in areas like TV and mobile where we're dependent on uh, manually testing devices. Um, so this was interesting because we were we were doing a retrospective on a decision that we didn't make. Um, but trying to understand the impact of it. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily have changed anything about this, because I would say the, the media experts are the people that know how to how to decide when to update the encoding software. Um, but it's, it was good to understand the impact um, for, for next time something like this happens. Uh, and finally, um, I partially included this example to show that you don't have to use the kind of fake architecture diagram. You can just do the standard scribbling. Um, but uh, people did quite like the, the tactile nature of using the counters to signify complexity and, um, and the little pins to signify who was involved. Um, so this is where we stopped having playback persist in the background throughout an iPlayer session. Um, and this was this was interesting because 
the the technical side of it, the, the implementation was very simple. And in fact, we we wanted we wanted to make this change because it massively simplified um, iPlayer on TV um, in terms of device performance, uh, as well as clearing off a load of technical debt. But the complexity was actually in the product decision, like understanding how users would react to this change and making sure that the various um, the various stakeholders were, were happy for us to actually make this quite large user experience change um, because it helped us technically. Um, and then the actual change itself was, yeah, fairly limited um, just to the playback area, but um, uh, again, there was some level of impact. So it comes back to the racy idea of, well, the playback team are the only ones that are really responsible for it, but then the product, uh, the product and UX people are accountable for the impact on the audience. And then the other TV application teams um, were kind of consulted and informed um, on, on the changes being made and where technical debt could be cleaned up uh, after this was done. Um, and uh, just wanted to call out some other insights from the exercises that we ran. Um, so yeah, I talked a bit about informed versus consulted um, before, but yeah, we found in hindsight, there was instances where we informed people we should have consulted them. Um, an interesting one was consciously not aligning, and it comes back to what I was saying about, um, you know, prioritizing uh, quality and speed over alignment. Because um, I think some something we found is sometimes you can do too much dry, and so too much don't repeat yourself. Um, if problems look similar, sometimes trying to force the same implementation on similar but different things is, is actually um, quite harmful for innovation and for speed, uh, long-term speed, not just short-term speed. Uh, talked a bit about org structure. Yeah, we saw that mirrored um, in the sessions that we did. Um, the closer the org structure, the easier it is to collaborate. Uh, Cross-discipline, yeah, this was a theme as well. It's really important to understand when to bring in the product people or the UX people or the, the architecture team, um, depending on the nature of the decision and, and the factors that I've talked about. Um, and process and culture versus technical versus, uh, and implementation. Um, so similar to what I was saying about the, the playback in the background example where the technical impact was small and the product impact was high. Um, we found other examples where rather than the product, it was actually teams process and teams culture. So, you know, um, where like teams would have to completely change the way they did uh, releases. Um, they had to maybe adopt more of like a continuous delivery culture when they weren't used to it. Um, or you know, potentially forcing things like inner source culture on teams that weren't used to it. Um, those sorts of factors um, can easily be missed. And we did find when we ran these retrospectives that, that we looked at the technical side, we didn't look at the process and culture side. So if there are process and culture changes that need to be made, it's really important that, um, that you take that into account uh, and finally, yeah, kind of the the impact. You, you might you might try and take a decision that you think has low impact, but then when you look at it in hindsight with this retrospective exercise, actually a lot more people were impacted by that decision than you originally thought, or maybe the change was a lot more complex than you originally thought. So uh, yeah, it was a really interesting exercise doing that with all the TV teams. Um, so I guess my final thoughts that I wanted to uh, share to summarize was, uh, yeah, retro your decisions. It's something we've found really useful. I'd say if you want to use that exercise, use that printout, um, I'll share the slides in Slack or just ping me on Slack if you have any questions. Um, making decisions transparently and collaboratively uh, is really important. Uh, I suppose where necessary, say like low complexity, low scope decisions, you might want to use the kind of team autonomy, strong ownership model. Um, and yeah, decision-making involves many factors. And we didn't realize quite how many factors there are in decision-making uh, until we really started looking at it. Uh, so yeah, that's it from me. Uh, I'll 
stop sharing and uh, take a look at the questions. Thank you, everyone.